Silver investors could make a fortune. Billionaire Eric Sprott and other top gold analysts predict that silver will dramatically outperform the yellow metal. In order to maximize your exposure to silver, consider shares of Golden Arrow Resources trading on the TSX Venture under GRG and the US as GARWF, where insiders have accumulated 50% of the company and billion dollar giant Silver Standard Resources has taken an 8% stake in the company. This company has 250 million ounces of silver resources and is headed up by the one man who is responsible for the largest silver deposit discovery in history. Learn more at futuremoneytrends.com slash silver100. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have the guy who follows the gold market like nobody else. Uh, his insights and analysis are the best when it comes to understanding what's really happening with the gold price, the day-to-day -day moves, and as a sweetener, he also has amazing economic analysis. And, you know, the, the, at this point, we're looking at doctored. Everything's been doctored that uh, comes out from the media. Uh, and it's, it's pure, pure propaganda and manipulation. And it's nice when you have somebody like Andy Hoffman of Miles Franklin to go through all of this data. A uh, very educated guy. He's been in the business for a long time. But he studies this, again, like nobody else. And he can kind of let us know where all the bull crap is. Um, I'll be uh, soft spoken on that. But Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you. And, you know, the calm tone of my voice now may not be the same tone you'll hear at the end of this podcast, given today's billion and a half dollars of notional gold dumped on the market in one second's time at the open of the Comex, which just happens to be the day before Comex options expiration and two days before the all important Janet Yellen speech where she'll say absolutely nothing is because the entire world knows she's going to say nothing because there's nothing could, that she could say. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, watching the markets and why I can be reassuring, et cetera, Look, if you're in paper markets, I can't reassure anything because they could do anything when uh, when the buttons are when the fingers are being pushed on the computer buttons. But that said, the beauty of everything that has to do with economic nature is that there are limits. In the case of physical precious metals, it has the ultimate limit in that there's barely any actual above ground inventory out there. And the more that prices have been pushed down, the more it has contributed to that tightness by causing the undisputed peak undisputed it has happened already not oh it's going to happen gold and silver production peaked last year they uh they went down last year uh and they're going to con continue to go down and at the same time uh demand around the world was at an all-time high and above ground inventories even the ones that they publish are at all-time lows and i'm sure if we saw the unpublished one such as whatever still remains in the coffers of uh central banks like or the or tre the U.S. Treasury, whatever still remains that's uh, available for sale, I'm sure is very very tiny compared to where it was when this scheme started 15 years ago. So that's the limit on trying to manipulate physical markets, let alone when currencies are crashing and people around the world are clamoring for something that will save their purchasing power. When it comes to financial markets, again, the risks of being in them are far greater because the 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 games, both upside and downside. Uh, you know, are, are far larger and far more more dangerous. But there are practical limitations, such as in the case of, for instance, I wrote the myth of QE to infinity a while ago. We're already seeing the fact that the Japanese government, for instance, ran out of bonds to buy, so they're buying stocks. Now they're running out of stocks to buy. The ECB pretty much ran out of sovereign bonds to buy, so their choices are either to buy the, all of them or to diversify into corporate bonds which has turned Europe now into a hotbed of, of uh, fascism and socialism that like nothing we've ever seen before. Uh, so and, and again, there's always that specter of hyperinflation, because if you can continue to print money and try to prop up markets, you're eventually going to cause hyperinflation, as we are seeing in many parts of the world now. That word hyperinflation is uh, most people only consider bad inflation if it's like Venezuela. But the cost of living around the world is soaring ironically, as much in a lot of these places which complain of deflation, like Japan, where they have some of the amongst the highest cost of living in the world, uh, and London, for instance, as anywhere else. And now you're seeing, you know, some of those markets that were propped up crashing. 
Uh, the London, you know, it's amazing. They prop up stock markets for a little bit and they claim everything is OK. If everything was OK post Brexit, why did the Bank of England just cut interest rates to practically zero and say we're going to do it again, raise QE, dramatically lower their economic forecasts and watch the pound fall by 15 percent? And by the way, the high end property market in London fell 20 percent in a week and it's still falling. And it's not just London. The high end Vancouver market has fallen 25 percent in the past month. I mean, this is where money that was supposed to protect people uh, from these policies was was put in. It was all, you know, dissolved uh, it, within weeks time. And eventually the same thing will happen with stock markets, whether it's in whether it's nominally or in, in a 2008 style crash. And of course, in bonds, I mean, we're talking about a third of all the bonds in the world now trading with negative yields. And people are talking about how we're going to raise interest rates with the worst imaginable economy, the worst economic conditions of our lifetimes, with crashing commodity prices, with an election on top of that, elections everywhere on top of that, and the highest debt of all time everywhere. Of course, they're not going to be raising interest rates. They're going to be lowering them. It's the monetary roach motel. They're going to lower and lower and lower them until eventually there's a crash or hyperinflation. And they're going to suppress precious metals prices until all of a sudden there's a shortage like we had in 2008 and 11 and 13 and 15. And arguably, except for 2008, there were no real crises in the other times we had major shortages, which were principally focused on silver. So I assume that that, you know, pretty soon we're going to get to a point where not only are we past the point of no return, where no longer can things be propped up, but you will no longer have avenues to protect yourself. Andy, there are several questions I have for you uh, that just from the comments you've made that I really want our, our listeners to f fully understand. So first off, this morning is uh, Wednesday morning and uh, about a billion and a half dollars worth of gold uh, hit the bid. So for people who are listening to this, who don't follow this, who are just trying to buy some physical gold from Miles Franklin or wherever they're getting it and they don't <laughs> understand what the heck just happened, can you explain to us real quickly uh, how much, first off, why someone would not, why a wealthy person or a wealthy fund, that why that is not normal, and what would be normal uh, if you were going to exit a position of $1.5 billion? Well, if you're going to exit any position, you, what you do is you try to trade out of the position. Uh, you're very careful. You only hit the bid if you know the bid is, is not going to go down without you selling anything. Uh, the fact that someone quote, dumped $1.5 billion on the market doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they got filled on the order. It doesn't mean they put an order in. You know, there's never that kind of supply in any market on the bid. Uh, and, and that, you know, then when you say someone, it's not someone, it's the U.S. government. I mean, it's, it's what I call the gold cartel. And even when people say, well, the gold cartel is the bullion banks and everything. No, no, it's the U.S. government. It's the, it's the entity at the top with the deepest pockets and, and the most to lose from monetary disorder. They need to still be the world's reserve currency because it allows them to print more money than everyone else. It still causes massive cost of, of living increase. But, uh, you know, because with the reserve currency, meaning there's more dollars out there, so they're harder to get rid of and they're, they're more used for things, we can get away with printing more money. And the only way we can continue with that is if this Ponzi con game where people actually believe the dollar is worth something continues. And that's why they are constantly attacking gold. What happened today is nothing new. I mean, I've watched this every single day for 15 years. Uh, you know, lately it's been much more subdued. Because, because the, you know, so many people around the world are catching on to this con game and they've been buying gold. That's why gold in practically every currency in the world is at or near, or in some cases, way above previous all-time highs. It's only here at the center of manipulation where it's 30 percent below. But everywhere else around the world, they're, I, I say, enjoying record high prices, but they're enjoying them at the expense of, of a, a far greater cost of living increase and, and, and political and social strife, uh, which is ultimately what we're going to see here. Yeah, so, no, what, what, what is happening is the government is trying to protect its position. But as I said, starting early in this call, there's practical limits because when demand's at a record high and supply is falling and inventories are all but non-existent, you know, you're only going to exacerbate this trend. I mean, you know, we haven't had we've had a couple of, of, of hits this year in gold and silver during this. You know, the bull market clearly restarted earlier this year. We've had a couple of minor hits, but nothing is egregious as what we've seen in the past two or three weeks, which as I, as I said, coincidentally is timed perfectly with the literally 
two slowest weeks of the year outside of the Christmas week, where everyone is on vacation. I mean, look, look at the news. There's like no news articles because everyone's on vacation. So when you when you see on Sunday night at, at 6 p.m. Eastern, when I looked at my uh, my phone and saw that silver had fallen 40 cents in the first minute of trading on Sunday night, when everyone on Asia is, is asleep and everyone in America is at a barbecue, which is, by the way, exactly where I was, you realize how desperate the efforts are and how everyone sees this by now. I mean, and again, you don't believe me that everyone sees it? What about George Soros and John Paulson and Stan Druckenmiller and Jeff Gunlock and all the, the big money people who are telling you that, that they see it? If the big money sees it, of course, the, you know, the governments and, the, the, and the, uh, the sovereign wealth funds see it too. So again, you know, we're in the late stages here. If you don't know what's going on and you're worried, you should look at this and go, wow, silver was $19.70 on Thursday afternoon. And it's eighteen dollars and fifty five cents today when nothing else has changed really in any other market except, by the way, interest rates have plummeted in front of the so-called hawkish uh, Janet Yellen speech tomorrow or Friday. It's not going to be a hawkish speech. The point is, all you're doing is getting a gift because it's going to eventually cause the premiums to surge and the supplies to disappear. And all those trends that I'm talking about of the worst economy ever they're only going to get worse. Uh, here, perfect example is oil, right? I mean, earlier this year, I mean, two years ago, two years ago, I, I wrote, everyone should read the uh, Dyer's Prediction of All. I kind of channeled my David Stockman um, in saying, oh, my God, there's so much oversupply from all of these years of money printing and financial engineering of everything from ghost cities to, to copper mines that we're going to be in a, a prolonged deflation of, of, of uh, industry for years to come. And sure enough, you know, commodities got crushed. This year, VMIX is down about 25% since I said that. Uh, and then this year, we got to $25 per barrel oil. And all of a sudden, what I deem the oil PPT, there's no doubt in my mind that this oil PPT was created because, let's face it, that was one of the biggest catalysts of the collapse earlier this year when stock markets had their worst start of the year. Because everyone knows that, I think it's a third of all U.S. CapEx and probably more of global CapEx is commodity related and oil and gas is by far the, the most. And so they're trying to prevent all these defaults, which are going to happen, like in the shale companies, for instance, from occurring. So they push prices up to $50. They constantly create rumors of OPEC freezes, not even cuts, freezes, it's ridiculous, freezing production at record levels. I mean, OPEC. Saudi announced record production last week, so we're supposed to believe that somehow they're going to help on the supply side. And they got prices to $50, and then they crashed back to $39, you know, which is more realistic. And then sure enough, the other day, more rumors of production freeze announcements, and they're all unfounded. They've already been denied. But they're so desperate to prop things up, like just as desperate to prop oil up as they are to keep gold down. And they're going to fail miserably on both fronts because we have record, record bad fundamentals for oil and stocks and bonds and real estate and record positive fundamentals for precious metals. And all these trends I'm talking about are only going to exacerbate them. It's a it's a catch-22. It's a, a feedback loop. Everything that the central banks do, everything that the politicians do, everything the corporate titans try is only going to make things worse for them and better for people who are who are embracing reality. Sure. It's, it's certainly imploding on itself. And you can see that the whole economy is fraudulent. Uh, Central banks, you got Eastern Central Banks buying gold, Andy, and then you've got the Western Central Banks buying stocks. And I'm, I'm actually kind of interested in that. Uh, you, you know, first of all, people need to understand these guys are literally printing money to buy shares. This is an absolute scam. It makes the whole, it, it contaminates the whole thing beyond point of it. It's, it's before, before it was a manipulated joke. Now it's just outright open fraud when you got central banks printing money out of thin air to buy shares. Uh, with that said, though, Andy, just like Eastern Central Banks are obviously hedging the fiat currency world in the U.S. dollar with uh, gold, do you think it's possible these central bankers who are literally making up it as they go along at this point with their experiment, they know they're going to crash and burn, but hey, they they have some, some Google and some McDonald's and some ExxonMobil on the books now. Shoot, even the Swiss National Bank just disclosed a few weeks ago they've got uh, mining shares. Deutsche Bank has mining shares. Is it even? Is it you know? Is it is it possible that there is is more than just the manipulation? That you know, when this whole thing implodes, hey, I'd rather have a, a share of McDonald's stock than um, the U.S. dollar. 
No, I don't give them that much credit. Uh, I would think that the smarter ones, and of course some of those guys aren't pure Keynesian Atlas Shrugged uh, cartoon characters. I mean, some of them got to their positions by being reasonably intelligent in monetary and financial matters. So I would bet that some of them have stashes of gold and silver. They, they certainly know they can't talk about that, but I'm sure some of them do. And as for, you know, a share of McDonald's protecting you, well, first of all, McDonald's shares have done terrible because their business is falling apart. But no, I don't believe that that there's that much. I don't that, give enough hey, credence. McDonald's yeah. might be fine dining in a few years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's already being priced like fine dining. People don't even realize when you, you know, that this supposedly cheap place is not so cheap anymore. Uh, but but again, no, the, the guys at the Fed, they, for the most part, they are they are brainwashed, highly paid government employees. I mean, the, the Atlas Shrugged is such a perfect, a perfect uh, analogy of where they stand. They've they pretty much sold their souls uh, for these situations years and years ago. Uh, you know, Janet Yellen uh, doesn't even remember if she ever once embraced reality because she's been in, in ensconced in a system which pays her very, very well and gives her all this respect and admiration for basically spewing lies and she also knows at the same time that her job and her livelihood and her reputation and credibility depending on propagating those lies so it's you know it's kind of like the Goebbels thing the more you repeat a lie the you know the, the the more likely people are going to believe it including yourself so while I do believe that some of them are, are, are know what's gonna happen occasionally uh, there was a guy Warsh he Kevin Warsh he, he comes out and he says stuff all the time like that and I'm sure some of their partners. And again, when we talk about the cartel and, I, and people say, well, it's the bullion banks. No, J.P. Morgan is not the cartel. J.P. Morgan is the partner of the cartel. The cartel is the U.S. government and any other Western governments interested in maintaining the status quo. They are just their partner. They're their operating arm. They're the ones who do the trades for them. So they are out there in the markets. They're, it's probably them or one of their proxies that, sh that, that throws a billion and a half of gold at the market in one minute to push the price down. And they, of course, know beforehand this is coming so they can, you know, they can front run it and make money doing it. Uh, but they, for the most part, I'm sure they all know exactly how the game works, uh, that, that they're not brainwashed. And I'm sure the people at J.P. Morgan have plenty of gold and silver, including Jamie Dimon. And in fact, according to Ted Butler, if you believe his data, J.P. Morgan has the biggest stash of physical silver in the history of the planet, not including its, its quote, custodianship of the SLV, which is theoretically the biggest stash of silver. So I'm sure J.P. Morgan will do just fine, assuming that they are not pitchforked or bankrupted by the, all their derivatives uh, when eventually that whole game goes, which may be De Deutsche Bank that catalyzes or something else that we haven't even seen yet. Uh, but no, th the biggest thing that I need to impart on people and I have tried for years is, because look, there's so many people out there that want to believe that everything is so simple. Look, there's just a handful of guys, the Rothschilds are sitting in a room planning and if just things go a little wrong for their plan, everything is going to go wrong, or maybe it's web bots or, straight, or solar flares or biblical prophecies or, or something that's going to explain things. There's no explanation. The explanation is can kicking to the highest order, keystone cops armed with, with weapons of mass financial destruction, just trying to keep the status quo going for a little more. And like the movie Fargo, it's the best imaginable example of what of how this game works. Once they dig themselves that hole, they just have to dig deeper and deeper. In the beginning of Fargo, the guy just needed a little money, so he arranged a fake kidnapping. He figured he'd pay the ransom, and, and the next thing you know, he'd have his money and all is good. And by the end of the movie, everyone is dead. That's the situation when you're in a Ponzi scheme, which is what fiat currency is. We're at the later stages now. Currencies are dying, commodities are dying, political and social order are dying, and of course, and of course, uh, you know, the, the monetary system is dying. So that's where we stand right now. There's no higher order in control of what's going on. There's nothing planned about what's going on, although there's plenty of meetings trying to stave off reality. But no, they will not stop reality. They have not stopped reality. Look where we are today and tell me, for instance, you know, Mario Draghi. 
three and a half years ago said he'd do whatever it takes to save the euro. Whatever it takes. I mean, does any did anyone even say at the time, well, how could you save the euro by printing as much euros as possible? Well, sure, sure enough, he did print as much euros as possible. And the euro currency is falling apart. The euro continent is falling apart. And by proxy, the entire global economy is falling apart. So for anyone who believes that these guys are omniscient or they have any idea what they're doing or that monetary policy worked, they don't. They just have the ability to manipulate markets to a point where over a short period of time it feels like someone knows something but they don't know something they are wrong about everything they screw up everything and in the end game everything that they try fails and it has throughout history not just now always Andy, last question. I want to talk about silver supply. We've got 26 uh, zinc mines shutting down temporarily in China until uh, next June. We've had major zinc mines and uh, lead mines go uh, actually uh, de deplete themselves. In fact, HUD Bay just announced a few uh, months ago that uh, their 77 mine, uh, 777 mine, excuse me, is uh, is done. It'll be it'll be kaput in two years. Um, and then looking at the primary silver producers as if they're really even primary silver producers, there's only really truly like three or four that you could actually say that today. Most people don't realize that when it comes to Pan American silver or Hecla mining or even Tahoe resources, these you can either call them base metal companies or gold companies, but you know less than half the revenues even come from silver. What does the supply look for for silver right now? Are we going to, I know you and I have talked about this potential cliff dive. Um, do, do, what, do, what do the cards look like for silver for the next, let's say, 12 to 18 months for physical supply from the mines? Well, if you go back to the Miles Franken All-Star webinar silver panel from, I think, October 2014, uh, that was David Morgan, Harvey Oregon, Bill Holter, and Steve St. Angelo. I hope I didn't miss someone, but it's two plus years ago <laughs> that, that we did that panel. And we, you know, we came to the conclusion that at the way things were going, again, this is 2014, we could see a 25 to 50% drop in silver production over the next decade. And you know, sure enough, in 2015, unequivocally, because everyone in our sector is always like, oh, you're always saying things are going to happen. No, no. Silver peaked. It was down last year. I think silver production last year was down 5% or so. It was. Uh, yeah. Well, it's going to keep falling. And as you said, uh, you're talking about uh, zinc mines. Zinc is, you know, two-thirds of all silver production in the world is the byproduct of other mines, principally copper and lead zinc mines, uh, a little bit gold mine, but mostly copper and lead zinc. Now, zinc of the three metals you're talking about has been the one that has performed the best. Copper and lead prices have fallen off the map. Both of them are, are close to all time lows. So if you're seeing zinc mines shut down right now, and most zinc mines, by the way, are zinc lead, uh, you're going to see far more in the coming uh, in the coming years. And uh, and we've already had the production start to decline. And I can't emphasize enough, I just talked about the direst prediction of all article I wrote. D industrial demand is toast around the world for years to come. Not not like for a year, six months. I love when these people go, oh, well, the oil, there's historic inventories, but don't worry, it'll, it'll, it'll correct itself in six months. No, it won't. We're a year from where we were. I mean, last year, uh, the gasoline stocks in America, we were an all-time high. I think they're 25% higher right now. And people are like, well, yeah, well, it's going to correct in a year. No, it won't, especially because demand is going to fall. And every time these idiots talk up the oil price, look what happened. The rig count goes up and all the, the what they call the frack log comes on. All those wells that were drilled, the oversupply of wells, they come on. So all these things are going to keep going down. Copper, lead, and zinc, are you kidding me? Demand is plummeting around the world. China, uh, sorry, Japan? I just wrote last week the ugliest economic data I've ever seen, which is actually part two, because Japan's imports and exports fell in July, in July by 25% and 15% in one month. Okay, that's the future of demand. Demand is not stable, it's going down. Uh, so you're going to see a huge oversupply of commodities, particularly things like copper and lead and zinc. So you're gonna see more and more mines shut down at a time where we already have historic lows. Uh, in supply. And then you look at, I mean, you know, there's nothing more manipulated than the COMEX inventories, but they're showing all time low silver inventories. I mean, they're down like what, 90% from 2011 or 2013? There's like $500 million left, dollars, not, you know, not 500 million ounces, dollars left. That's all. And uh, you know that the same is, is going to be the case everywhere. 
So, you know, we're talking about we've had silver shortages in 08, 11, 13, and 15. And with the exception of 08, we didn't even have a real crisis. Here we're talking about the whole world falling apart politically, economically, monetarily. And, uh, you know, now they're, you know, they're, they're really pushing their luck here with this pushing the prices down this fast because it's just going to instigate a new shortage. And, you know, here we are going into the fall, which is the time where most of these things start to, to unfold. So I expect, you know, I wrote back in June, I wrote the upcoming historic silver shortage. And I believe that the second that any that the semblance of summer doldrums control is broken and there are more than enough catalysts coming in the next few weeks to, to break that down as soon as that even mildly breaks i think you're going to see a fear like we haven't seen since 2008 except this time there's three times as much demand in the world for silver as there was in 2008 and production is lower and above ground inventories are lower so if we're specifically talking about silver and it's ridiculous gold silver ratio of 75 or whatever it is compared to the historic rate of more like 15 and the rate it comes out of the ground, uh, which is more like nine, absolutely ridiculous. It's the uh, the investment of a lifetime. Uh, but be careful how you do it and who you do it with because times are going to be tough and uh, there's going to be a lot of fraud out there. And that's why a company like Miles Franklin, which has been around 27 years without a single registered complaint, uh, is going to be someone you're going to want to turn to. Absolutely. I, I do my business with Miles Franklin. And uh, look, everybody, if you want to diversify uh, out of country, which I highly, highly recommend, uh, Miles Franklin has storage in country and out of country. But I, I happen to recommend the out of country ones more just because I think uh, you should have good, safe diversification. And the neighboring countries also, there's a huge benefit of that, obviously, from just a mobility standpoint. Uh, everybody check out milesfranklin.com. You can also see Andy Hoffman's daily uh, blog as well as his audio blog. Andy Hoffman of Miles Franklin, thank you so much for your time, sir. Oh, always a pleasure, Daniel.